So uh, take it away. All right. And since Bruno also asked me to give a bit more about myself, I've known uh, people at the Redwood Center for a long time since I became friends with Charles Fry, who is no longer with us, which makes it sound like he died, which he is not. <laughs> and now I work at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and I like math a lot. Okay, that's all the personal detail we need for now. All right, first is going to be a sales pitch, because every talk about math always has a bit of a selling point, because in the end, to get math, you have to actually do some math. Like, you can't learn it purely by just re listening to a lecture about it. So I'm, but on the other hand, I'm going to make it as easy as possible. So here's some things you won't have to learn if you learn this. You, two of which I've highlighted in green as things you probably already know. Of, you don't need to learn about complex numbers, because they basically correspond to rotations, which will be covered in this. You don't need to learn vector calculus, because all the weird identities of vector calculus are subsumed into this framework, and it actually adds a few new ones. You don't need to learn about quaternions, and if you don't know what quaternions are, great, you don't need to know about them. <laughs> if you do know about them, 3D rotations. You don't need to know projective geometry, and if you don't know that, also great. And for the more mathematically inclined, you won't have to learn differential forms or a lot of algebraic topology. This basically gives you a generalized theory of meshes. And also, you don't have to learn how to write every primitive operation yourself, because here are at least three libraries. There are more you can find on bivector.net. But these are three libraries that I personally use and like a lot. This talk is mostly going to be about geometric algebra. There'll be a little bit about geometric calculus at the end if there's some time. But the calculus builds on the algebra, so we start there. And we're going to start with some show and tell. So we're going to play a little game, or a slightly sped up version of one, which is to illustrate some of the primitive operations, which I'm not going to really tell you what they are. You'll see them. And then I will walk through what are the operations and how are some of them implemented. The talk is going to be a little bit light on details, because there's like a decent amount of material, but I want to focus on a big core of it. So the basic objects are going to be points, lines, planes, boxes, and higher dimensional versions. Since this is mostly a talk about 3D world, because we live in a 3D world, it's mostly going to stick from the zero dimensional points to the three dimensional boxes, with a special focus on planes. One thing you can do as a primitive operation is union points together, which will form the line that goes through both of them, like this. You can do a dual operation with lines, where you can take two lines and you can intersect them, and you'll get the point that's in between, as shown here. You can form midpoints. So say these two points are called A and B. Then A plus B over 2 will give you the midpoint. Same formula that you see in standard uh, something, whatever class teaches that. I just have a question yeah. about the unions and intersections. Yeah, yeah. If they're the same, um, oh, could you use the, the same? For that? Yeah. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, if it's the union of like two points that are the same or two lines that are the same, do you get back that point or that line? Yes, I believe so. Okay. You'll have an item potent there. You can just hold on to the mic and then okay. someone else needs to pass them. Actually, I think if you intersect two lines that are parallel, you'll get a point at infinity. It will still collapse in dimension. Good question. Another primitive operation is orthogonal projection, <laughs> which seen here lets you construct the line that will go through the point in the corresponding line while being orthogonal to both. Another orthogonal projection, and then to construct that point, I can add lines. Adding is like what you've seen, where you add things component-wise. These are all oriented. So if this one line is going up and this one line is going up, you'll get a line that goes like that. And to the people on Zoom, I hope you can see my hands, because this is going to be a little confusing <laughs> otherwise. Maybe we can set up that Sorry, people on Zoom. I 
Actually, can I ask a question about that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, so I can imagine two lines you get if you add ten lines if they're in the plane, right? One splits them this way, and then one splits them that way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is there a handedness to your lines? Like, is there a directionality to them? Or? Yes. This doesn't. This uh, demo does not draw little arrows, but it should. Everything is oriented. This. Oh, okay. This whole thing gives a general theory of directed numbers, where everything has a magnitude and it has a direction. Okay. Magnitude corresponds to things like mass, moment of inertia, etc. The magnitude is okay. What way is it going or spinning in? Where it can correspond to velocity, moment of inertia, so generalized sort of direction. And there's a handedness to your plane. Yes, everything is oriented. Okay. Orientedness is extremely important because it's what lets you define the idea of inside and outside. Right now, the Zoom people just see the uh, icon, like a, a caricature of your face. They don't see anything from the camera. So I guess the Do they see this? Yeah, well, they, they, see they, see, they see that. But OK, well, that's what they need to see. In terms of motion, like they can't see you or anything. If you turn you the camera, turn camera on. How do I turn it on, though? No, that, no that, that's not on. It's, it's not getting any kind of input at all. Let me see real quick if I can do it. But if I cannot, I will have to give up on that one. I will leave it to you guys to mess with the camera since. OK, now for a little bit of a liver demo. This is the ortho center of a triangle. You can sort of, s you might be able to see what it is and how it's constructed. There. It's a triangle center. So it will go through the. If you draw lines from each of the vertices of the triangle to the opposite side, such that it cuts the orth opposite side orthogonally, all three lines will go through a common point, and that's called the orthocenter. Hence the ortho for orthogonal center, because it's central. And you can construct it. And then I can join the two lines. And here is the actual working formula for it in the usable code, where if my triangle is ABC, I can first create the sides of the triangle by joining A and B and C and D. So these bits, oh, that's the other one. A join B, this bit right there. A join C, that bit right there. Then this thing corresponds to orthogonal projection. It's supposed to look like the orthogonal symbol. So the orthogonal projection will give me two lines, which I can then intersect to find their common point. Notice that I only need to use two of the sides, and this corresponds to the fact that triangles are determined by side angle in between and another side. The third side is determined by these three, so you never really need to ex refer to explicitly. But to determine the triangle, you do need all three points, which is why you get A union B, A union C, and then B will show up as well. You need all A, B, and C to show up somewhere in lines. And then I can intersect them. Can do a similar operation with circumcenter. And this is actually where you can see some of the meshing idea come out. Because the way the circumcenter is constructed is you can take midpoints, then create lines. And then you can project and do that again. But I can also just keep connecting by taking more midpoints. And you can see a sort of symmetry pattern arise. If you keep doing this, this corresponds to meshing the space, basically by turning it into a giant binary tree, where you start with an initial triangle, you cut it into sub-triangles, you cut those sub-triangles into sub-triangles by taking midpoints, drawing sub-ones. And if you do this recursively, you'll have meshed the whole triangle. And this is just a simple way to see that idea. Does, this, does the center of the center triangle converge okay. to a particular center? Does the center of the center triangle, if you were to do this recursively, converge to a different Yes, it is the circumcenter. That's why you can see the circumcenter, the red dot is in the middle. They will all sort of dance around it and dive into it. And you'll get something that looks this way, very much like a sort of Sierpinski triangle kind of thing, like a very middle thirds, like a kind of cut a triangle into four, three on the outside, and then one inner yeah. triangle, and then you keep doing that. And just from these operations, 
Because each operation has an exact description with a single operator, you can write down the entire formula from the construction. So this gives you a nice way of using both a formula and a picture. You can make a picture, write down construction, and then get the formula out of the picture. Or from the formula, you can just plug in random values and see what picture comes out of it. And you can build up more complicated things. Here, let me finish this construction. Euler's line is the line that will go through the circumcenter and the orthocenter. And the easy way to compute it is just this formula, which is to just do what I said. Take the circumcenter, take the orthocenter, union them together, because it's point, union, point, which is line. And then you're done. Can you construct any line or point this way in finitely many operations? Or are there some points that you'd want to hit in space that you would have to converge to through like some sort of agreement? It depends on your initial setup of starting points. OK, good. Okay. Yeah, because like in that example, you, if you take any point, say you take the point 3 fourths of the way along one of them, right. let's, you can write them out in binary. And then by this midpointing process, you can see the binary for that be what, like 1, 1? Point one one, right. okay. two so two steps, half and then a half of the half to get you to the three fourths point, and you find points by binary search. But some could take infinitely many. On the other hand, for almost any real problem, you don't just have to do this in this purely synthetic way. You actually have a ruler that tells you how long things are, so you can just measure lengths directly. Right. Okay. The game doesn't really expose that to you because it's too powerful <laughs> and kind of annoying to do. It would be make the whole thing kind of trivial. And now I'm going to crib another guy's examples, which I do for this whole talk, because so many great demos that I didn't have to make myself. So this is rotor estimation. And I'll tell you what this thing means. So there's a point cloud, which I think starts out red, an initial point cloud. And then you rotate the point cloud. And you're trying to reconstruct the rotation. And this whole thing can be done by automatic differentiation. The operation of rotation itself corresponds to an oriented plane, because it's a plane that you're orienting in and rotating through by some angle. And you can try and reconstruct the plane. Since you all, basically, you know the closed form for what a rotation sh can look like. And now you just have to fill in unknown coefficients. And you can move points around. Although weirdly not on the iPad, only on my computer does it seem to work if I drag points around. And it will automatically recompute. And these circles will change shape to compute their uh, rotated versions. And this will do a best fit reconstruction of point cloud. Because the rotation can be in any plane. In fact, it can be in all three planes at once. So it can do a fully 3D rotation without any extra effort. So can I just add, yeah? clarify? So, so you start off with a point cloud. Use the mic. OK. Uh, so you, you start off with a point cloud, and then you rotate the point cloud, and then you want to solve for the rotation given like corresponding pairs of points? Yes. We, so just given pairs of clouds. You don't give them the pairs of points. Oh, I see. Pairs the whole cloud can be reconstructed. Cloud. Yes. So I give you, so how does, how do you know then what point goes with what? If I just give you this cloud of points and this cloud of points, is it just going to figure all that out? or? Yeah. You take a cost function, and it can fit it. It's a cost function, but it doesn't have to be ordered. So there's no, there's no explicit um, pairing. Yeah. You don't have to have a pairing. If you want a pairing, you can have a pairing. Yeah. And then the whole thing, because for every pair of points, in 3D space, you can always rotate one point into another point, because you can always find a plane that will yes. go through both yes. points, in fact, infinitely many, right. and rotate in arbitrary ways. Good. I see. So then the, but there's only, one, there's only one way to describe that, like one rotation. Yeah, the it's whole thing. It's a best solution. fit reconstruction. Uh, very cool. And so you're saying somehow that just kind of naturally falls out of this yes, exactly. framework. Yeah. Cool. You can encode the idea of rotate in the x, 2x, 2.4 xz plane minus the 3.7 yz plane, like a very specific plane. You can encode rotate by angle, well, any angle, either clockwise or counterclockwise, in that plane as a primitive element. 
And you can even then add on the idea of then translate by like five units. And that whole thing is just a single element, which will be made a little clearer well, probably right about now. And last example from this, because this one, well, actually two. Here is an example relevant to robotics, which is figuring out if two things intersect. And the intersect just corresponds to, for this rotating triangle, take its three lines, see if the lines are intersecting the interior of this box. You can determine that using all those union and intersection operations I mentioned earlier, pretty straightforwardly. This is also where the idea of orientation is useful because you can say what's inside the thing and what's outside the thing. You can actually turn inside and outside. In, you can invert them by flipping signs. Where did you go? Ah, here it is. So the way that this is constructed is that code snippet and I wish the resolution was better because then I would walk through some of the code in a little more detail but we can take a quick look well, that's, and that's readable through some oh perfect so all these operations all these things can be constructed pretty straightforwardly and then the same motor or same element is acting on all of them which is why they're all rotating and moving in space in a consistent way even though they're all different shapes the same code and the same element acting on them in the same way will give you consistent movement as you'd expect, which encodes the idea of like rotate through this. Well, you can see like the top row is all going in a similar way. Like if you imagine putting this inside the donut, you can see that it's sort of tracking the donut's normal. Yeah. Honestly, with a sphere, that one isn't really seeable, or shouldn't be considering mm -hmm. it's a sphere. But because the thing is illuminated, you can see it. All right. So that was a lot of pictures, now for some equations. And I think I've said this analogy to some of you guys that these numbers are sort of like generalized billiard balls, but the more I've been thinking about it, it's actually a pretty good analogy in that just like billiard balls, they have magnitude or mass, and they have a direction they're going in. And they even have a sort of conservation of momentum kind of thing because they act on each other by reflections. Just like if you take two billiard balls and you smack them into each other, they will reflect off each other. And the angles at which they reflect is basically a function of their mass and their initial positions or initial velocities and orient yeah, orientations, their initial direction. They will go and then reflect off. The core object is called a multi-vector. You guys have seen points and vectors, I would imagine. A vector basically is a line, an oriented line segment. But in 3D, well, there's three dimensions. So we have two more. We have planes and we have boxes. And these are called bivectors and trivectors because the naming is lazy. And here are the basis sets of them. There isn't really a basis for the scalars because they're just scalars. I guess the basis would be the number one. In 3D space, you have the x, y, z that correspond to the three directions you can move in. And you have the x, oops, I don't see that. Okay. Yeah. x, y, y, z, and x, z planes. I might have swapped the order of x, z, and y, z, but work with me. And then finally, you have the x, y, z box. And in 3D space, there's only really one. If you permute any of the indices, it corresponds to the sign changing because the orientation will change which is why you see these little swirly things that are tracking its orientation. And a multi-vector can be some or all of these at, all t at any time, where they're added together, where the sum basically corresponds to a disjoint union of like zero-dimensional part, one-dimensional part, two-dimensional part, three-dimensional part. So in 2D, would you just have the scalar and two vectors, and that's it? Scalar, two vectors, and Oh, and one by vector. And one by vector, I see. Yeah. Great. Cool. For the whole thing. This is also why there are six degrees of freedom. Because of ways to move in lines. Here's how you, in fact, here's the degrees of freedom formula for any dimension, not just three. It's n choose one plus n choose two. n choose one, which is equal to n. 
because in n-dimensional space, there's n directions to move in lines, its basis set. And there are n shoes too many planes, basis planes that are orthogonal to each other that you can move in in three-dimensional space because it's x, y, y, z, x, z. That corresponds to roll, pitch, yaw. In four dimensions, I don't think they have any special name. So from this formula, you could see that in four dimensions, there are 10 degrees of freedom. In five dimensions, I think, what is that? That's five plus, is that also 10 degrees of freedom? And I think six is 15 degrees of freedom. And now you know the formula for any dimension, which is kind of fun. OK, so now we have objects. We have these multivectors. We have like 1 plus x plus x, y plus x, y, z, stuff like that. OK, but what do we do with them? This is the basic operation. And it corresponds to the fact that space itself splits into an anti-symmetric and a symmetric part. The symmetric part is basically the dot product, the inner product, hence the emphasis on the word inner. It is, if you swap these two arguments, a dot b is equal to b dot a, so it's symmetric. It corresponds basically to the similarity of things, because if you're looking at a cosine, the cosine of 0 is 1. And Therefore, the dot product between two things is maximized in magnitude. The direction, there could be a negative sign if they're in opposite directions. The dot product is maximized when things are parallel. This is called the wedge product, and it, or the outer product. And this is the new bit. Like the dot product you guys have probably seen before. Yes? Zoom can see any of the pointers. Maybe just and if you can, try turning on a camera just in Zoom. Maybe it won't take long. That would help all the people who can Zoom to see what you're looking at. Right now, I think camera. I could also do it like this. Could I show them on my turn, turn video on. And Zoom. Yeah. First, I'll just go to like a laptop. And... Oh, does, does, does your Zoom have an option to turn the video on? Let's see. When it says switch camera, the switch camera is only switching between like a front and back view, which isn't quite what you want. Yeah, what I'm seeing in Zoom is just this. Oh, hey, Connor, so nice of you to join. Oh, this is kind of fun, seeing my own hand. All right. Inner product, measure of similarity. Well, just, well, just for an instant, you had it. Just for an instant, yeah, there was a. What the hell? I, I think it's, what you did. His microphone is on, so it switches his camera. So people on Zoom will pin Connor's camera okay. to their screen on the side, then they can see oh, okay. All right. both. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, Alok. Yeah. Alok. Alok, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we'll do that. Okay. So this gives us a measure of the similarity between two vectors. But vectors aren't always similar. Sometimes they're orthogonal. And most of the time, they're somewhere between parallel and orthogonal. And this captures the second part, their dissimilarity. If this is like their projection from something, this is like the rejection. It is anti-symmetric. And the reason why is because the outer product of two vectors corresponds to take the two vectors and sweep one along the other. This will induce an orientation. And depending on which one you sweep along which one, the orientations will be opposites. So A wedge B is the negative B wedge A. And you guys have seen something like this maybe in a physics class. It's like the, like whenever you take a cross product, the reason cross products are so weird and don't have any good algebraic identities is because they're actually the dual of the wedge product. Because when you take a cross product, you're always talking about an oriented plane, but you're talking about it by taking a third vector, which happens to be orthogonal to the two vectors that generate the plane. And you're sort of using it like a handle that you just carry around. And every time you want to talk about the plane, you end up doing some sort of unit vector dotted with this uh, orthogonal one, and you'll get out a surface element. That's why surface integrals have that term n hat dot ds, because they correspond to take bits of a surface, cut it up, 
and then stick them together, which makes a lot of sense considering the whole point of an integral is that it's a giant sum. And from this, we can see the take the unit basis vector, so the x, y, z uh, lines concretely. If you take x times itself with this geometric product, it will be x dot x plus x wedge x. And x wedge x actually will be 0 because, well, x is completely parallel with itself. And if you sweep it along itself, you will get well, really an infinitesimal parallelogram, which is just a line. It will sweep out 0 area because there is no area in between a line and itself. So n dot ds is actually a pseudo-scalar, not a scalar? Yes, exactly. And that's great. That, uh, yeah. Oh. I, I, I asked if x, n dot ds in surface integrals was a pseudo-scalar. Uh, it's a pseudo-scalar in 2D space. It's a pseudo vector in 3D space. The dimension of the underlying space so is very the important. The dot product is a pseudo scalar in 3D, right? Is a dot product to a vector and a pseudo vector? A dot product of a vector and a pseudo vector? Oh, yeah, n, n dot ds is a, a, a bi vector dotted with a vector, right? Or, 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 the, no, or, in or, this or usual n dot ds, n is a vector. Okay. And ds would be a surface. So it will give you a vector. But then that vector, I think, is inverted again to give you a plane. The whole thing goes through like these three layers of indirection, which is why I hate the formula, because there's a better one. Great. Great. But we expect it to give you a pseudo-scalar, because ultimately it's telling something about like by, by, uh, by volumes. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the yeah. volume inside the surface. Yes, exactly. Because right. you're trying to talk about like the, the volume in 3D space is like, yeah, as you point out, pseudo-scalar is a perfect word, because you get a pairing. For any dimension, you will get a sort of duality between the different grades of elements. So let's take 3D space concretely. 0, 1, 2, 3. Those are the dimensions. And these are the dualities you will get. You can see this one from the cross product. And you can see this one from things like divergence, which people say divergence is a scalar, but you can make it flip under reflection, its sign will flip, which is not true of regular scalars. And you get a similar thing with lines and planes, which is why the cross product formula works at all. It, and that's why it only works in 3D. Even though the basic principle of an oriented plane as an embedded 2D object works in any dimension. Well, any dimension, at least two. Doesn't make so much sense in dimension one. Are you going to tell us how to, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of how to evaluate this product for different dimensionalities? Like, in some cases, it's clear, certainly, you know, the dot product of two vectors is understandable, so is the, uh, the wedge product. But, like, how do you take the dot product of a generic, you know, vector with uh, a, a bivector or something in, in you know, if they're yeah. not nicely? I won't show you every case, but I will give you specifically some reference after. But I am going to do some non trivial cases. Cool. Because the whole point is that the formulas don't depend on the dimension. There will be more terms because the dimension is higher, but each piece will always be as simple as the simplest possible case. Like the whole point of this is that it's supposed to be dimension independent. It gives you an intrinsic way of talking about everything. So you get the advantage of being able to break things up into components, but you are never actually picking a basis. You're just saying that you have three vectors that are orthogonal, which three you never have to specify until the very end, or if at all. Yeah. Actually, there's a uh, another operator that generates the dot product to subspaces. So actually, you can yeah, project that's... any subspaces, any multi vector to another multi vector, similar to uh, the dot product, the unit product. Yeah. This also gives us. If you keep just the inner product or the outer product, they're not invertible, but actually if you keep them together and you add them like this in the geometric product, sometimes this product is actually invertible. So you can divide vectors. Actually, you can divide, sorry, not just by vectors, but by multi-vectors, which is really useful. Kramer's rule, for example, is basically an application of this, but Kramer's rule isn't super useful. 
there are other more interesting uses of it. And this division will become very relevant quickly when we start talking about pinhole cameras in the human eye. Where the inverse of something, well, since it's a product, A inverse times A should equal the unit scalar, one. And as a concrete example, the inverse of the two lines x plus y is themselves divided by two. If you multiply it out, which I have done, and I crossed out these terms, x, y, x wedge. If I write them next to each other by juxtaposition, yes. And if they happen to be orthogonal, because they will have no inner product component because they're orthogonal, it's equivalent to the wedge product in the case of orthogonal ones. And why I'm pointing that up, out, you're about to find out. Because the x, y, and y, x are negatives of each other. So I can replace y, x with negative x, y, and then this will cancel. From the calculation I did before, unit vectors have length 1, 1 half, 1 half, and add it up together. You get to that x plus y times x plus y over 2 equals 1. And therefore, that's its inverse. And so that's a concrete example of actually doing some division with this geometric product. I also worked out an example of the wedge product of how do you actually compute it, where these are vectors in 2D space. And wedging them together, well, 1, 1 you could write as x plus y component-wise, wedged with, oh, it's right there actually, <laughs> wedged with 3x plus 2y. The wedge product is like I said earlier that it's anti-symmetric, it's a product, it will distribute over addition as well. It's associative. It has all the nice properties of a product that you sort of intuitively expect from multiplication, which means you already kind of do know how to calculate it as long as you remember that's anti-symmetric. Because then you can expand these out. x times 3x, oh, and you can take scalars and you can move them around. So this is x times 3x. I can pull out the 3 and put it in the front. So I get 3 times x. 3 times x wedge itself, x wedge itself is 0, y wedge itself is also 0. And from the inner terms, we get 2xy plane plus 3yx plane, flip sign, get the negative xy plane. And since I was doing the full inner product, I also did, sorry, the full geometric product, I also do the inner part. The inner product of those two vectors is just 5. So the geometric product is actually a scalar plus a bivector, well, minus a bivector. So this grade one element, a line, geometric producted with another line, will give you a point plus a plane. And here, you guys can just stare at this one a little. This is how do you multiply planes together, add them. And you can sort of see that it's the same idea. Like you're just using the fact that you can move terms around, but they might pick up negative signs. So once you've seen the case, in the case of like a two vector, the three, four higher, there's just going to be more terms. Like a four vector would be like E1, E2, E3, E4, which is kind of ugly, but is not technically any harder. I recommend using a computer for the longer ones. Still sort of. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. So um, could you say something about uh, like the, just, uh, how you're overriding the plus operator? So like you say plus, and I'm adding let's say, a vector to a bivector or a pseudo scale yeah. or something. The plus is basically a disjoint union of subspaces, 1D subspaces, 2D subspaces. And I'm saying like take this, very much like the bundling operation you see in VSAs, because it basically is the same thing. Like you're bundling them all together as a sort of assorted bag of elements of different grades. Sometimes the grades will mix, but usually only when you're multiplying them. The addition keeps them separate. Just like if you're taking some arbitrary vector, you can break it up component-wise by basis ones, and you would do A1, E1, plus A2, E2, plus A3, E3, and 3D, where the E1, E2, E3 are all lines, but you're keeping them separate in a similar way. It's just an extension of the idea where instead of x, y, z, it's x, y, y, z, and more combinations depending on the dimension. 
Okay, now for something relevant to vision and the brain. Motion. Starting with the idea of infinity. This is a really unifying idea where you can take a space and you can say, you can add a point that's near and far at the same time, like so close but so far, a point at infinity. If you have a plane or if you have a line, this lets you write everything as a circle. Points are circles of infinitely small radius. Does anyone not see this? Because it is a key point. OK. Circles are circles of finite radius, like you'd expect them to be. And the interesting one, lines are also circles, but of infinite radius, which I've sort of drawn here. This is why you see like an idea of perspective, where everything, all far away lines seem to meet at points. And they do if that point is infinitely far away. They meet at some unspecified point in like the center of your vision. And being able to treat everything as circles lets you do a bunch of operations that are basically exception free because you can freely convert between lines, points, and circles in intermediate computations and everything will work itself out and you don't have weird special cases to think about. This is also useful because then there are no special cases. Then all lines will meet at exactly one point, even parallel ones. Parallel ones will meet precisely at infinity. All parallel lines will actually meet at infinity. Very much like all the points on the center of your vision are all sort of together. Uh, I'm a little confused by that. So, yeah? so certainly all parallel lines, like in your perspective drawing there, yeah. in the middle, it's true, all parallel lines are meeting at the same point on the horizon. Mm -hmm. But other lines on the other lines in the horizontal plane there and that grassy field are going are to point to a different point on the horizon if they aren't parallel with the other ones, right? In other words, like Oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, <coughs> sure, the, the, the eaves on those buildings and the, and the road all converge to the same point on the horizon, but if there were a, a road that were going at a, you know, that an way? angle, yeah. it would converge to it, those lines would converge to a, a different point on the horizon. Oh, yeah. I guess the points will actually sweep out a circle very far away. But oh, I see. The okay. point, I see. Yeah. The, all those vanishing points form a circle. Yeah. yeah. There's like an equivalent, like a point on the circle yeah. represents yeah. every yeah. parallel line. Or just like in this way, space, it's, the line of space really does wrap into a circle. Or if you're looking at, say, 2D space, a flat plane, like a big sheet of paper, and you put a point, the whole thing will become like the outer surface of a ball, so a sphere. And the higher dimensional cases, you kind of lose the easy visualization. But the point is that line becomes circle if you add a point at infinity. So in a sense, the circle is a line plus a point at infinity. And in this way, like lines and circles aren't different and shouldn't be seen that way. Because seeing it that way makes things harder to understand, not easier. Stuff like the, like you mentioned the log polar transformation a while ago, Chris. The log polar transformation like, comes from this fact that you can take a sort of canonical spherical coordinate system by taking space itself and slicing it up into these shells that go all the way down to single points. So infinitely small shells, infinitely wide ones if you're doing whole lines. And yeah, you can kind of see some of this principle from one of these drawings. All right, I think this is one of the highlights, personally. Can you just explain the intuition again for why the line and the point of infinity gets to the circle? I, I'm just sure. trying to uh, Looking for a marker. There's a few ways you can see it. One is that, OK, if you take a, take a circular arc and just like zoom in on a segment of it, the more you zoom, the flatter it will look. I'm just going to give yeah. like three vague pictures, yeah. and I think you'll be able to get it from that. Yeah, yeah. Well, another picture is the curvature of a circle is 1 over its radius. If its radius is infinite, its curvature is 1 over infinity, or 0, which is the curvature of a line. There's also a pretty good uh, visualization of it, which I can send you later, because I forgot where it was. Was there any other one? Those are the two big ones. You can also see it by explicitly crunching some algebra, but that I'm not going to do. Don't really have time for that. So building off Mike's question, yeah. uh, suppose that we buy this and a yeah. line is just a circle that goes through a point at infinity. Yeah. Then um, you know, there's, there's an axiom that any two lines intersect once. Uh, so then now, OK, sure, two parallel lines now intersect at infinity, right? Yeah. 
But then if you have two lines that are not parallel, they intersect in a finite point. But yeah. also, you know, if, if both these two lines go through the single point at infinity, then don't they intersect there too? Do they go through infinity? No, because they don't. They no. go to different points on the circle. Well, but, yeah. but, but then we're not adding a point at infinity, right? You're saying you're adding a lot of points at infinity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's like, what is really the structure of this space that we're adding? It's called projective space, and one way, another way to see a projective space is like, you can see, like you can take R2, like take a plane, and you can actually imagine it as being one among like an infinite sheet of planes stacked on top of each other, separated only by being all parallel, like an infinite stack of infinite parallel planes. And that would be the real projective plane over R2. And this will give you a sort of similar picture. I would have to. Wait, sorry, I don't see how that connects at all. Like, is it one plane is like the original plane and then the Yeah, it's like plane. one is identifies an origin of your original plane, and by adding all these stacks over it, it. Okay, not a good picture. I will think on that more and give you a more complete answer later. Is that right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Here are the basic motions, like just motion in the sense of the real world. You can translate, you can rotate, and you can scale, dilate. And those describe a lot of motions in the world, actual world. Oh, and you can reflect. But it turns out that the real primitive is reflection. And this is why I started talking about circles, because it's going to become clear right about here. You can represent everything by reflections. Because of this equivalence between lines and circles, thanks to this point of infinity, you can represent a translation as an infinite rotation. You're rotating along an infinite circle, which looks like you're just going straight. So translations are rotations. A rotation can be represented as two reflections. where if you reflect from u to u prime, and then from u prime to u double prime, so you're reflecting along v and w, that will just correspond to rotating u all the way through u double prime. And this works out the general case. Oh. And to actually compute a reflection concretely using this geometric product, here's how you do so. To reflect an object u around an object v, you conjugate by it. And that's the thing where you multiply by v on one side and v inverse on the other side. And if you flip which side the inverse is on, that just corresponds to reflecting, I think, with an opposite orientation. And this formula is pretty nice because if you compose reflections together, just like the power, like why diagonalizing a matrix is useful for taking powers, because if you take powers of diagonalized form, let's say, you want to reflect by A and some object X. You want to reflect it by A, and then you want to reflect it by B. The formula will be A inverse XA. And then to reflect by B, you multiply that whole thing by B inverse, the thing in the middle, B, which just corresponds to B inverse A inverse X uh, AB. So the geometric product composes nicely with reflections. Reflect by A and then B is just multiply by A and then B on the left and right. And it's, uh, let's see. Um, and it's, I mean, uh, I mean, you need sort of two for it to be orientation preserving, right? Because that's sort of like part of the. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can like decide if you want it to be like a symmetric or anti symmetric. You know, display. Yeah. You have a decent amount of control there. And here is a visual indication of this idea of being able to reflect everything. If you want to do a rotation, one reflection will flip it. Since you see this little toy, its head was here, and now it's there. But then another flip, and it will turn through and get its head back. So here you can see more viscerally, uh, rotation is a double reflection. One reflection will partially move it, but the sign is wrong. Another reflection will move it the other half of the way and flip the sign back to what it needs to be. So is it the case though any even number of reflections corresponds to some rotation? Yes. And you're saying you can always 
if you if you're clever, you can always using the formula you wrote, you can always break it down into two reflections. Yes. If you know what rotation you want. Yeah, yeah. You can you always get a canonical decomposition that there's only really one way to write it, and that you can figure out the way pretty much directly. Well, I mean, there's not one. Uh, there's one. There's one. One like way to do it's one short one. Yeah. yeah. Right. There are many ways to do it, but there's like one good way typically that tends to suggest itself as you're just like doing the algebra in practice. Because yeah, if I do ten, ref if I just do ten random reflections, it'll. You know, yeah, you can work it out to five you rotations. Can figure it out how to yeah. rewrite it in terms of two. Yeah. In the plane. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, is that right? So that's not true for. Uh, I guess that's. So if you're in ten dimensions. Yeah. I guess Any, but here's the theorem at the very, look at the very top left. Any orthogonal transformation from n space to n space is at most n reflections. I see. So you always have a bound on how many reflections you'll need. So this I'm gives you sort of ref yeah, it gives you a sort of reflection oh, calculus, yeah, yeah. like a whole calculating system by reflections. And because of, look at the last one. You can reflect not just through lines or points, but through their curved oh, versions. Like the hell? Is this still, or maybe, maybe the um, batteries are gone. Should we swap out the question battery for the speaker battery? Yeah, let's, um, yeah, yeah, well, let's just, let's, instead of using, um, switch the yeah, mic well, input. There might be more battery. What the? Oh, uh, wait, I think I might know what went wrong. Well, maybe you got cut out of Zoom. Yes, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just thinking if you were to have like, a, let's say you're on R3 and you have a reflection. Let's say I want to sweep, you know, I want to rotate along this plane. Yeah. But uh, I could actually do that by going out and a bit out of the way first and then down. You know, like a, like a, maybe I make an off. Join with video. I'm not orthogonal. Oh, we'll we'll find yeah. rotational plane. Oh, yeah. plane. Yeah. A reflection plane. So sort of the plane is here. Uh, sort of like oh, it seems to. That's Connor's thing. Unless, see if you can switch yeah. the camera yeah. over here. <laughs> I'm still using my I'm camera you that's you just pointing at the floor. Do you need more than two? Oh, can you give me share permission, 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 permission again? Well, oh. I think. I think what you said is probably true. Even though I have to think about it, I don't. I haven't done it. I never say this formally. That if you're in three dimensions, all you need is two reflections, not just to get the location you want, to get whatever orientation yeah. you want. Yeah. And yeah. That's, but if you're in four dimensions, now you need four. Huh. Okay, yeah. now I nice you can't do it with three, right? Because you yeah. you're in the wrong, you'd be flipped. Yeah, but for the degree of free coming, that makes sense. Degree of free coming. Yeah. All right. Let's, just, let's check and see if it sounds bad. I mean, you need three rotation vectors. In, gen like these, uh, in general, I guess, three dimensions. I guess it's more for a specific. Okay, yeah. Rotation. So it's the sounds back. All right. So it's all possible. Like, yeah. All right, we're back. Oh, okay. Guys, yeah. another illustration of the principle. I think you were still on scale. So you're saying it was. Oh, yeah. yeah. If you reflect through, well, very much like a, this is basically optics. If you reflect through a circle, you will get some effect. You get the dilation, and then two reflections through concentric circles, so nested circles, will give you a scaling. And if you reflected, say, the other way, then the thing would shrink. Very much like a magnifying glass or a telescope, because it pretty much is a magnifying glass or a telescope. And being able to move things, turn them, and scale them describes most of the things that can happen to real world objects without breaking them in some fundamental way. Because it preserves, they're all isometric. Well, not isometric. Okay. That one's not isometric, but they will all preserve the basic relationship. They're all conformal in that the angle between any pairs of things is always preserved. So no tearing. I think it's stronger than that, though, right? There's a lot of conformal transformations that are not included in yeah. these operations. Right? Yeah, but if I had one more operation, actually they are. Inversion. This. You can get this, this is where the, the fact that you can divide is important. Because an inversion corresponds to r squared. Because x over the, its magnitude is the inverse of x itself. That's r squared x inverse written in bad handwriting. And a 
illustration of circle inversion is given here. The inverse of this point is this point if you're inverting it through this circle, the red one. And here are some pictures of what that looks like. You basically will end up doing, this is stereographic projection, and you'll end up swapping the ideas of near and far. So everything far away, or originally far away, will go into the middle really far, and then things that are close by will just sort of like get enormous and all hang out near the edges. Like if you invert a chessboard with respect to a circle, you see that the little patterns start wrapping around and they cut off the drawing, but they would keep nesting themselves. And you can use this principle to create a pinhole camera. Because if you have focus two points, draw a line through them, you can take four points and create the plane through them by the wedge product. See, A1 wedge, A2, A3. And then to find the pinhole point and sample it, it's, you intersect these two objects. And because you have their primitive descriptions, you can just take the intersection as a primitive as well. And that gives you the pinhole. If you move your focus point and basically probe the image a bunch of times, point by point, you'll end up doing a pixel by pixel reconstruction of it. So this is a one-liner pinhole camera. And here's an illustration of doing it sort of conformally. Doing it conformally, if you do a pinhole, the setup before, the issue is that you can't, these sort of wrap around into each other, and you need a way to distinguish them. But if you add a point at infinity and a point that's infinitesimally close to zero, so you sort of double wrap it as a sphere, and if that doesn't make sense, sorry, I'm just going to have to move fast you get a way of representing a scene very faithfully by circles and sheets. And they will correspond to sampling like around light cones. And a nice googly eye drawing of part of the principle that's going on. Probably gonna skip the bit about complex numbers after all. All right, since I'm out of time, I'm just going to give the last part, the continuous picture, because this has so many cool pictures, and it's my personal favorite part. <laughs> this is taking, like earlier we talked about the geometric product as being inner plus outer parts, and having this sort of symmetry, anti-symmetry property. Here's if you take the infinitesimal picture of the thing. Then you get that this gradient of something is going to be equal to an inner part, which you've seen as the divergence. So pure sources or sinks, and a sink is a negative source. So arrows that are always going out, and pure circulations, which is basically the curl. This is also called the exterior derivative and the interior derivative, because that's what they are. And they have the same sort of symmetry, anti-symmetry properties. And to see what they actually look like, here's a decomposition. Ignore the bottom one. This is like a second order term which I couldn't cut out of the picture. This vector field, you can break it up into the sum of a, the interior part, which you notice has a very sort of spiky look to it. Everything's always going out in some way. And then a very flowy part, which is pure circulation. If you add these up, you would get that field. Plus some second order component that's like its waviness. Another one, if you see from fluid dynamics, some flow. You can break it up into an incompressible part, and it can't be compressed because compressing it corresponds to making it a divergence, because you would get some point that has like infinite density and then goes outward because it has so much pressure on it. But you can't do that. So you get an incompressible part, a pure circulating flow, and then it's pure divergence, which basically is where is it going? What's the force along it? So in that case, you, you get one fewer component than you might expect. Yeah. Uh, was the flow, did we assume that the flow we were decomposing was incompressible? Like, uh, I'm trying to figure out why we only get two components here and we had three before. Oh, for the harmonic part as well. <coughs> I think there is a harmonic part, but this picture just doesn't show it. But would it go to zero? 
Like the harmonic part is if there's some sort of waviness about it. Maybe, I think harmonic components can be gradient flow. So maybe this includes both. Huh. I don't know either. And one last decomposition. Like you can see sort of in the visual character of kind of what is going on. That general flows can be broken up in this way. And this is called the Helmholtz or Hodge decomposition. The Hodge decomposition is actually some super fancy math because it goes really deep and is basically related to the idea of using differential equations to cut up space and study it by thinking of it as water. Like one way to figure out if a surface has holes is to pour a bunch of water on it and look if the water seems to fall into any sink. And that's potential holes. And last one, which I just look, think looks cool as well. And on a somewhat philosophical note, the reason we care about being able to cut things like this and have a sort of theory of meshes and triangles, because triangles show up pretty heavily in this, because you get boxes which inform them. Of the ways to cut up things, even abstractly, there are only a few. You can cut things into generalized circles, triangles, boxes, cubes, which are a closed subcategory of boxes, and trees. Like even in a really, really abstract sense of writing a type checker. And that's mostly just a sales pitch for why triangles are important and why meshing shows up everywhere because it's one of the fundamental ways of decomposing things or combining them at all. And that's the talk. Thanks for listening. All right. Now I'm gonna go to the Zoom people who I've just been brutally ignoring. Sorry guys. You guys had no questions, so I guess it was fine. Yeah, if anybody in Zoom asks a question, you type it in chat. I'm tempted to ask something else. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, it's an interesting talk. I, I, I love the stuff. But um, I should have studied it more when I was young. Um, but I, I don't know. Uh, I'm surprised that you say that all possible conformal transformations are, are, are now possible if you include the, uh, that inversion operation. Or that there's yeah, at least in 2D. In higher. Because I think it encompasses all the Mobius transformations in higher dimensions. And the Mobius transformations, because the Mobius transformations are what, like A, B plus C over, you get some linear term, some, a multivector divided by a multivector to describe a Mobius transformation in general. And in dimensions higher than true, I think, higher than two, I think the Mobius transformations are the only conformal transformations. In dimension two specifically, I don't know if it's every single one, but it is a very large fraction of them and might be all of them. That one I would have to think a bit more. That part for my complex analysis class, I forget. I think there's something that says live broadcast from Zoom is stopped. No. All right, well, thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah, also, thank you so much for walking with everybody through it. I think there's some cool nuggets there, especially the like just getting into more of the like projective hyperbolic stuff is fun. Um, I guess maybe a question, uh, like maybe uh, if you could go back to your uh, page on. Uh, when you say uh, when the claim you made about all transformations of some kind being possible now that you include inversion, maybe you can go back to that yeah. portion. All the Euclidean transformations. Okay, so you just mean rigid, rigid actions on R3. Yeah. Or R, R, RN. Yeah. yeah, rigid but also scaling. Which is, yeah, okay, I, I, well, sure, sure, I see, yeah, right. But just in general, like you could have the space of all diffeomorphisms of RN. And this is clearly just like a tiny. Yeah, that. but the space of all diffeomorphisms is like insanely large. Uh, certainly, certainly. But you can imagine if I'm going to deform some object or stretch or squeeze some object, you know, in mm -hmm. some way that's not isotropic. Or, yeah. You know. If it has any sort of regularities locally, though, you can do techniques like this by just cutting just it up and then looking at it piece by piece and working it out. Basically, mesh the thing. Right, right. So you're saying like, yeah, right. Any of those actions you could express as a local, in terms of Rigid actions on local meshes. Yeah. Yeah. It's useful for describing real objects because, for one thing, it works nicely with the operations that would actually preserve the object abstraction. Like, if I'm trying to talk about this as some object, but then I throw it hard enough to smash it into little bits and it breaks apart, it's not really a remote anymore. 
So in that way, transformations that keep its angles preserved actually map pretty nicely to the real world conception of what preserves this thing at all. What preserves the object abstraction. I guess I'm, I'm trying to think of other signal domains 